it's much easier then to think, right, that they'll get somebody. The 20 years down the line, to have that hope is harder. A huge police operation got underway, but despite extensive inquiries and a national public appeal, detectives drew a blank. Four months later, they turned to Crime Watch. The reconstruction started with Caroline's journey home along the river Leven on Saturday the 24th of August at 9pm. It was her mother Margaret's 40th birthday the next day and as she prepared to go out and celebrate, Caroline again left the house, this time to meet her best friend Joanne. I asked her where she was going, she said, I'm going to get Joanne. And I said, right, that's fine, but mind your time, mind and be back. Um, and it's the usual, like, yes, yes, yes. And, and that was the last I saw her. For the next few hours, Caroline and Joanne drifted around the Bon Hill estate, meeting friends. Joanne and two others went home to watch videos whilst Caroline walked alone to go to her boyfriend's house in Renton on the other side of the River Leven. It wasn't until 4 p.m. the next day, Sunday the 25th of August, that the grim discovery was made. Caroline's body was in the water. She had been violently attacked and had been dead for some hours. An anxious Margaret, who'd already reported her missing, received the worst news possible just a few hours later. I looked at the window and there was a police officer with a policewoman, and I knew, I knew then. I just, you know, you just, I just knew. Um, I, got, I got this unbelievable pain, which I can stop feel. Um, sorry, I get, it's just a pain in my heart. I just, just knew it was, it was her. Um, they came up and they asked about her, um, her clothing, which she'd on. Told them and they had said then that they believed that it was her, but it would have to identify her. Um, so of course, by this time, it is my birthday. Um, so life didn't begin at 40. Um, for me, it basically ended. Joanne Menzies was Caroline's best friend. As a grief-stricken 14-year-old, she bravely took part in the reconstruction herself. It was important to me because when me and Caroline were together that night, people, if I was an actress, um, people are not going to know the actress. I would do anything to help the characters on it. This is the area where me and Caroline actually parted. Caroline gave me a kiss and a cuddle and then said, I'll see you in a wee while. And she proceeded to walk down the stairs, down towards the back bridge to meet her boyfriend. 20 years on, she still cannot fully accept what happened that night. I felt guilty. Why did I not go with her? Maybe I could have helped her. The day they, they killed Caroline, they killed my only friend. I still, to this day, don't have a best friend. I'm a mother. And I should have been there to protect her. I should make things right. So this is my way of trying to make things right, trying to help to solve it. But I can't do that on my own. I need people to come forward. This is a child killer. This is the worst of the worst. You can't get any worse than this. It's people killing children. And Caroline was only a child. She's only 14. And these people should now stand up and actually finally be counted <clears throat> as a human being and not like 
no hiding a second secret. The two main answers that I need is who and why. Um, why is beyond me. Um, I, I just don't know. What would make somebody want to kill a 14-year-old lastly? There's always something missing. And there'll always be something missing. And that something is my daughter. Such a sad case. Detective Superintendent Jim Kerr from Police Scotland joins us now. You are still hoping to hear from witnesses. Tell us more about the route she took that night. Yeah, so just after midnight on Sunday, the 25th of August 1996, Caroline left the Bonhill shops and went down uh, into Dillichip uh, Loan, as you can see there on the monitor. Uh, across the Dillichip Bridge, commonly known as the Black Bridge, no longer there now, unfortunately, and down the towpath. So we left the Bonhill shops and across the, the Dillichip part there, having left um, Joanne there uh, for the last time. And you have... Jim, an e-fit of someone you really want to trace. Yes, when Caroline was uh, walking along Dillichip Lone, we have a witness who saw a man, sharp features, um, wearing a green hooded jacket, as you can see there. He's five feet six in height, 20 to 25 years of age. He's not came forward. We could really do with tracing him tonight. And you've got any other sightings on the night that are important? Yes, about quarter to one, two men, one wearing a green or blue hooded top, running in Bank Street near to the, what was then the Kippen Dairy. Again, despite repeated appeals over the last 20 years, those two men haven't come forward either, and, but they could be vital witnesses for us. And I gather, Jim, you believe that in those communities of Bonhill and Renton is where the answer lies? Uh, uh, undoubtedly. Um, you know, we are we're aware that uh, allegiances change. would appeal to anyone who had hesitation at the time to come forward and contact us tonight. There was a lot of speculation at the time. The community, some of which made up their minds as to what had happened and decided not to contact us. You know, the big issue here is there's a 14-year-old child murdered in the banks of the river leaving, so we'd urge the people to get in touch with us. Thank you, Detective Superintendent, very much indeed. If you do have any information which could help bring closure to this family of a murdered child, please get in touch. Call us now on our new number. It is 08085 600 600. Or if you prefer, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously. They're on 0800 555 one. Also, if you've been a victim of any crime, you may want to speak to Victim Support. They're on 0808 1689 one. All the contact details, including a dedicated email address for Jim and his team, are on the website. Melanie Road was just 17 when she was attacked as she made her way home from a nightclub in Bath in 1984. She was stabbed 26 times and died a short distance from the safety of her family home. Melanie was discovered in the early hours of the morning by a milkman and it was the start of what would become one of the UK's longest running and most challenging police investigations. Melanie. Melanie? 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 On Saturday, the 9th of June, 1984, the body of a young woman was found in the Lansdowne area of Bath. She had been brutally murdered. The hunt for the killer would span decades, involving hundreds of police officers and multiple investigation teams. The whole city of Bath was affected. I don't think they could believe that such a thing had happened in their city. The task facing us was massive. I always had the feeling it was going to be a matter of time. It just gripped me, and like everyone who'd gone before me and everyone who I worked with at the time, I wanted to be part of the team that solved it. One of the first people on the scene was Chief Inspector John Smith. I was in charge of scenes of crime at force headquarters, 
I was in the office actually at the time. I had a call to the office that uh, there was a serious crime had occurred in Bath. It was obvious that there had been a stroll. It's very sad because she was a young girl. No, no one wants to deal with that sort of crime, but that was, that was what was there and that was what we had to deal with. Our job was to protect any evidence that was available and make sure that that evidence was treated properly. Well, she'd suffered multiple stab wounds and that was clear to see where she was lying there on the ground. And it was obviously a violent death and not something that we experience very often, fortunately. And the obvious question is who's responsible. But it wasn't only the killer who needed to be identified. The only clue the police had to the victim was a key ring found near her body with the name Melanie on it. Police started driving around the streets and they had a loud hailer attached to their car. Melanie. And they were basically just saying, does anybody know Melanie. of a Melanie? We're trying to find a Melanie. Melanie. Her mum remembers it vividly even today, going out and knocking on the back of the car as it's just about to drive off, saying, we've got a Melanie, we've got a daughter called Melanie, and she hasn't come home. Melanie's family have written about the impact that their tragic loss has had on them. For her sister Karen, even today, the grief is very raw. I'd always longed for a baby sister. And when she was born, I thought all my prayers had been answered. She was pretty, sweet, and clever. We used to call her Little Duckling. With her NHS glasses, with a patch over one eye, I knew she was going to turn into a beautiful swan one day. 17-year-old Melanie Rode was the youngest of three. She lived with her parents, Jean and Anthony, in the Lansdowne area of Bath. She had dreams and wishes about being married, having children. That last morning, she'd bathed and dressed her youngest niece, a baby of just six weeks at the time. Heartbreakingly, her body was found just 200 meters from her home. She had been raped and stabbed 26 times. The last time I saw her was at 5 p.m. outside the Francis Hotel. I remember it perfectly. She leant over and kissed me on the cheek to say goodbye. She was going off to play tennis with her friends and she was looking forward to going out that evening. She had her whole life ahead of her. The whole world was opening up for her. Police now knew the name of the victim but who had so brutally cut her life short? Would a trail of blood left at the scene lead the police to her killer? In 1984, the principles are the same. It's all about methodology and being absolutely specific around what you're doing. And so you start, and they would have started with Melanie herself in situ there and looked around. There's a blood trail that seems to lead away from the body and goes out of St. Stephen's Court and out onto St. Stephen's Road. And although the spots were very, very small, at the beginning in St. Stephen's Court, there were lots of them. And then as they went down the road, they followed them all the way down the road to a set of steps and then out onto Camden Crescent. My senior crime officers were told that to follow each trail, mark each spot and then it would be swapped it was essential that it was marked and preserved so for future future evidential use it's almost like something out of an agatha christie isn't it there's this trail of blood leading away so whose blood is it all the blood was blood group a and our melanie was blood group a uh, but they had a special test that they could do that they called PGM and that's all to do with the proteins in the blood and from that they managed to distinguish that actually the blood came from two people and those two people was one was Melanie and the other person was the offender 
And even in 1984, established that only 3% of the population actually had that blood grouping. So it, the parameters were narrowed down, but of course not enough if you didn't know who your suspect was. A full-scale manhunt began. In the first year of the investigation, 94 people were arrested, but no one was charged. I think the crux of it is, is they did so much work at the beginning, there wasn't any more to be done. There wasn't any more to be dug out and be found. If it was to be had, somebody had to bring it to us. And there was a lot of publicity again around the anniversary in 1985 in order to see could we generate any new information. And at that point, they decided that that was it, that they would scale it down. Police were desperate to find Melanie's killer, yet faced with nothing but dead ends. But with the passage of time, developments in science and technology offered investigators new hope. In 1988, DNA started being used in casework, and by 1995, a national database was set up so DNA evidence could be checked against offenders' profiles. Swabs and clothing from the crime scene had been meticulously stored for 11 years. As a result, scientists were still able to extract a partial DNA profile from them. It must have been quite exciting times then, and I can imagine them sat there thinking, just wait a day or two and we'll be told our man's on the database. And that time came and they were told no DNA that matches your crime scene. Once again, the investigators' hopes were dashed. Five years later, another development in technology would offer a possible answer. My main involvement directly with the case came around about the year 2000 when I became a major crime specialist advisor. And part of my role was to review old murder cases to see if there was any way we could improve or, or get a better DNA profile. So I then had to review what we still held at the lab, what might be still available with the police, to see if we could work on any semen stain that might be left behind that hadn't been used up, and try and get an improved profile using the up-to-date then DNA technique. Fortunately, I was able to find some semen staining left over from Melanie's trousers, and we were able to get the up-to-date DNA profile at that point. We got very close. It wasn't a full profile, but it was very nearly. An improved DNA profile was a good lead, but it still wasn't enough to point them to the killer. Would Melanie's murderer ever be brought to justice? We had an almost complete profile we're thinking the offender injured himself. That's most useful to us because what it's saying is it was unlikely a consensual act and someone else has murdered her. And therefore, this was the offender's DNA we had. All we had to do was identify the right person to swab. So, you know, everyone was excited at the prospect. Detectives believed they were getting closer. Determined to crack the case, on the 25th anniversary of Melanie's murder, police turned to Crime Watch. They didn't predict the response they would get. For a quarter of a century, Melanie's family have had to live with the knowledge that her killer has never been caught. The reconstruction of what police believe to be Melanie's route home and the tragic events of that night sparked an influx of calls providing the investigation with 80 new names. One caller was of particular interest. He claimed to have actually spoken to the killer just moments after the attack. <laughs> 25 years on, here was a brand new witness. But would his information provide the breakthrough police had been waiting so long for. 
next week in the hunt for Melanie Rhodes' killer. He said to the man, have you just had an argument with your girlfriend? 97.5% sure it's going to be here. It's known in the business as a screamer. I just knew that I was going to solve it. Such an awful case for Melanie's poor family. Do join us next week to see how the extraordinary investigation progresses.